Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Katie, do you want to go ahead and share your screen? Okay, um, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I am Chief Knowledge Broker for OCTO, uh, which stands for Ocean Open Communications for the Ocean. And we are really glad you could be with us today. And uh, we're super pleased to welcome Katie Lebling from the World Resources Institute, who's gonna be speaking about ocean-based carbon dioxide removal, uh, the landscape of approaches and governance considerations. And this talk is gonna be based on um, a report that uh, the World Resources Institute, the WRI, uh, put out in November 21, um, entitled, let's see, let get it, uh, toward responsible and informed ocean-based carbon dioxide removal, research and governance priorities. And I'll be putting the link to that report in the chat in just a moment. Um, but before we get started, and I turn this over to Katie, I wanted to let everyone know um, how everything would run. First, we'll have a presentation by Katie, and, we'll, um, and then we'll have dedicated time for question and answers after. Um, you can send in questions and comments in two ways. You can send them either to the Q&A, uh, the Q&A interface or the chat. Um, it's a little easier for me to moderate if you send them to the Q&A. Um, but um, I would also, if you send it in the chat, that's fine too. I'll be monitoring that. Um, for the chat, it is open so everyone can share. Um, actually, let me just, uh, everyone is able to share. Um, in the chat, we just ask that you keep it professional. So if there's um, additional information you can provide on anything Katie's talking about, um, feel free to share it with other participants. But again, just please keep it professional. Okay, uh, Katie, we'll turn it over to you now. Thank you for being here. Great, thanks so much for having me. Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Katie Leveling. I'm a research associate at the World Resources Institute. Uh, where I work on carbon dioxide removal research and analysis to inform policy recommendations with a focus specifically on the United States. And so part of that work for the past year and a half or so has been on ocean-based carbon dioxide removal approaches, uh, which is the topic of this presentation. Um, and as Sarah said, what I'm going to present is a short summary of what we cover in a report that we put out in November um, of last year. And so just for the agenda for context, I'll do a very short background on WRI, just so you're familiar with the organization and where we're coming from. Um, then I'll do some background on why carbon removal is needed and why ocean-based carbon removal approaches are being considered. Um, and then an overview of the main ocean CDR approaches that are proposed an overview of the legal flame framework that applies to ocean CDR and then some recommendations and Q&A. And sorry, I should say, if I say CDR, I'm just referring to carbon dioxide removal as a abbreviation for that. Um, so WRI, World Resources Institute, is a global nonprofit research organization. We're based in Washington, DC, but we have uh, 14 offices around the world with nearly 2,000 staff. Um, I'm based out of the DC office. And across WRI, we feel we focus on seven different areas where we see challenges associated with the intersection of human development and sustainable resource usage. So these include cities, climate, energy, forests, food, ocean, and water. Um, our approach is very data and evidence focused, and we have a huge variety of projects ranging from real-time tracking of tropical forest defor tropical deforestation um, to evaluation of corporate climate pledges um, to partnerships with cities to help improve road safety. Um, and I'm based in the climate program and as, a, as I said, focused mostly on the US and federal policy related to carbon dioxide removal. Um, and the work that I've done on ocean-based CDR has been in collaboration with WRI's ocean program. 
So before going further, I just want to give some background on carbon dioxide removal broadly, um, also referred to as just carbon removal or CDR uh, throughout this presentation. So interest in this topic has grown a lot in the past few years, particularly since 2018. This is when the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, stated that to keep temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is what's outlined in the Paris Agreement, we are not we not only need to remove, um, reduce emissions very quickly, but we also need to remove CO2 directly from the atmosphere. This is because we need to reach net zero CO2 emissions by around mid-century and net zero GHG emissions soon thereafter. And in the longer term, need to bring CO2 concentrations closer to pre-industrial levels. So carbon removal can play a role in the near term. Um, counterbalancing emissions from sectors that are very hard to abate, such as non-CO2 emissions from agriculture or emissions from long-haul shipping. Uh, and in the longer term, it can help to actually bring atmospheric CO2 concentrations back down to levels that won't cause the devastating climate impacts we're already seeing. Um, and I want to I want to emphasize here that reducing emissions is the first and most important priority. And while the latest and most authoritative science on the topic says carbon removal will be needed alongside those reductions, it cannot be a substitute for those reductions. So the figure um, here, uh, the conventional emissions reduction techniques like switching to renewable energy and electric vehicles should make up the bulk of how we reach our uh, climate goals. So that's the gray wedge. Um, and carbon removal will likely play an increasing role in the coming decades, which is shown in green. Um, and I guess just more generally, my, we don't want to have to rely on carbon removal, but I think we're now in a situation where we've emitted so much that we will need to rely on it. So we're at the point where we, we have the opportunity to minimize that reliance by reducing emissions as much as possible in the near term. Um, and so when I say carbon removal, I'm referring to technologies and approaches that pull CO2 directly from the air and sequester it for climate relevant periods of time. Um, and this is different from carbon capture and storage or CCS, which captures emissions at a source like a power plant or a cement producer. So there's a wide range of CDR approaches and technologies that could be, could be used and they all have different approaches and trade-offs. Um, and you don't need to be able to read all of this. The point here is to illustrate that range and that they can be done both on land and in the ocean. Um, and land-based approaches range from familiar things like growing trees um, and increasing carbon sequestration in soils to more nascent approaches like using machines to chemically scrub CO2 directly from the air through direct air capture. Um, so what I'm going to focus on are the ocean-based approaches, which include things like growing and sinking seaweed to adding crushed rocks to seawater that react with and lock away CO2. So before getting into more detail about what these approaches are and how they work, I want to also just touch on why ocean-based CDR is even on the table as an option. So the first reason is pretty basic. The ocean um, covers 70% of the planet's surface, so it provides a lot of space where these approaches could be deployed. Secondly, the ocean is already one of uh, the planet's natural carbon sinks. It holds nearly 50 times the amount of carbon in the Earth's atmosphere, and it's already absorbed roughly one-third of human-caused emissions produced each year, so it has great potential to store more carbon. Um, using the ocean can also help diversify the portfolio of carbon removal solutions we have to address the climate crisis, which will be important, um, spreading the, that burden of CDR over many different potential approaches will reduce the risk of each, reduce the risk that is inherent in each one um, failing to be successful. So basically not putting all your eggs in one basket. Um, and many of the, many of these approaches could theoretically Deploy, be deployed in places where they wouldn't compete with other use of, uses of the ocean. Um, and of course, using the ocean also avoids some of the land constraints and land competition issues that land-based CDR approaches face. So now I'm just gonna do a brief overview of the main approaches that have been proposed in the scientific literature or in some cases have been 
tested at sea. So there are several different ways to categorize these approaches, but what I have here is a simple differentiation between biotic and abiotic approaches. So those that rely on both synthesis and biology and those that don't. Um, and I'll go through the, the seven in the same order that they're listed here. Um, so, so we include coastal blue carbon or coastal ecosystem restoration here to align with the CDR, ocean CDR taxonomies and other major reports. But I want to acknowledge it's a little bit of an outlier um, or a little bit different than the others because it's not really novel or new. Um, and we define coastal blue carbon as including salt marshes, mangroves, and seagrass meadows. And coastal blue carbon restoration works by storing organic carbon in coastal sediment where it persists for longer periods of time than in terrestrial soils. And of course, protection of existing coastal wetlands and other uh, carbon sinks is critical and should be top priority. But here we focus on restoration because that's what would result in additional carbon removal um, while protecting existing sinks as a form of avoided emissions. So coastal blue carbon ecosystem restoration has um, relatively uh, low carbon removal potential compared to the overall need, but a huge number of co-benefits that make it clearly worth pursuing um, at greater scales, like increased coastal resilience, improved water filtration, biodiversity, et cetera. So obviously this is this approach has been practiced for decades, though not necessarily with the objective of increasing carbon removal um, and, and more commonly for the coastal resilience or habitat restoration that it can provide. Um, and it presents minimal risk if native species are used and appropriate sites are selected. So overall, this is kind of a no regrets approach that we should definitely scale up in combination with other approaches. And across all the approaches, likely the one that's most familiar to people and most um, publicly accepted. Um, the next approach is seaweed or sometimes called macroalgae cultivation. Seaweed can be purposefully grown then harvested and sunk for sequestration of the carbon it contains in deep ocean water or seafloor sediment. It can also be used in a range of products, but most of these would not necessarily result in carbon removal. Risks of large-scale seaweed cultivation include nutrient depletion, light competition, and changes in oxygen and pH levels. There's also the potential benefit that reduced that seaweed could result in re reduced acidification locally as it takes up dissolved CO2 in surface waters. Um, assessments in the literature show significant theoretical carbon removal, but also note that logistical and other challenges related to growing and harvesting large amounts of seaweed could reduce this, this uh, potential. And today, countries like Japan, China, and Indonesia have led global production of seaweed so far, um, but mainly for food. So the West is just kind of beginning to catch up in terms of the capacity to be able to grow and harvest seaweed effectively. And there are several, I think a good handful of companies working on this approach today. One um, that's based in the US has gotten a lot of attention recently is called Running Tide. They, I believe are based out of Maine and have been doing some work there as well as more recently in Iceland, um, but there are other efforts also around the world. Oh, and this is just to illustrate the range of uses of um, harvested seaweed. It's not exhaustive, but I think it's um, unique among the approaches in that it, it produces this product that can be used in other products. And so as noted, the ones outside of deep ocean sinking would not necessarily result in carbon removal, but could reduce emissions in other ways. And one interesting approach that probably have seen in the news, the prospect of using certain types of seaweed as an additive to ruminant animal feed, so cows, goats, et cetera, um, as a way to cut down on the methane emissions they produce. Um, the next uh, approach is ocean fertilization, which involves addition of nutrients such as iron, nitrogen, and phosphorus to areas of the ocean where those are limiting nutrients for primary production or phytoplankton growth. So once more phytoplankton grows, some fraction of this is expected to move to the deep sea for storage, where it's sequestered through natural ocean cycles, specifically the biological carbon pump. It's then thought that additional atmospheric CO2 is drawn into the ocean to compensate for uh, the reduced dissolved CO2 concentrations in the surface water. 
known as the air sea flux. So thus removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, the most interest in this approach has been in iron fertilization because so little needs to be added to produce that, that phytoplankton bloom, which means that it's potentially low cost. This is also the most tested and the most controversial approach. Um, there have been about a dozen experiments at sea, I think since the mid 90s to the mid 2000s, early 2000s. Um, and all of them showed increased phytoplankton growth, but didn't track the movement of organic matter from the surface to the deep ocean or the uptake of atmospheric carbon into the ocean. So not clear whether they're effective as a, as a CDR approach. Um, ocean fertilization also includes um, risks to the environment and ecosystem, including reduced oxygen, nutrient depletion, and reduced light. Uh, changed ecosystem composition um, due to increased phytoplankton growth. And notably, there's also uncertainty across this and all approaches that rely on removing dissolved CO2 from surface waters of the ocean and then waiting for the atmosphere to reequilibrate. And there are questions about how long it takes for this reequilibration to happen. For example, what if the CO2 depleted surface water moves away from the surface before it reequilibrates? then no CO2 is removed from the air. So it can't be necessarily an effective um, CDR approach. So this approach has not really been pursued in the past 10 years or so after a 2012 incident where um, a businessman convinced a First Nations community in British Columbia to use iron fertilization as a way to increase salmon stocks. And that while the community was convinced to support this plan, it was considered a violation of international law. And so because of this incident, there's been a reluctance to restart research in this area. Um, though there has been some work I've seen in the US around developing a code of conduct to guide responsible research in the area. Um, so yeah, the next, um, the next approach is artificial upwelling, which targets a similar outcome to ocean fertilization. But instead of adding nutrients, the nutrients are pumped from the deep, um, deeper ocean where there's more nutrient rich water. And that nutrient rich water, the idea is that it will help spur phytoplankton blooms the same way that ocean fertilization could. The main potential benefit um, could be increased fish stocks. And it includes a lot of the same risks as ocean fertilization, as well as potential for outgassing of CO2. So as you move deep water from to the surface, the dissolved CO2 will come with it. Um, it could also interfere with ocean biota as some kind of infrastructure will be needed to pump the water. Um, and it could cause increased heat at the surface once upwelling stops. So there's this risk of kind of termination impacts. Um, it could also be used in combination with seaweed cultivation to allow uh, seaweed to grow in nutrient depleted areas. And it could be more useful for seaweed cultivation than for dedicated carbon dioxide removal. Um, excuse me, I've heard of one group, Climate Foundation, that's working on this concept in tandem with seaweed cultivation. Um, so alkalinity enhancement is the next approach. This, uh, I guess the first biotic or abiotic approach um, includes the addition of alkaline materials that react to react with dissolved CO2 in surface waters which stores carbon as bicarbonate and carbonate ions and results in additional uptake of atmospheric CO2 into the ocean. One benefit of this is locally reduced acidification. Um, it's often described as like an antacid for the ocean there. And I think there's some oyster farmers that use this already as a way to reduce acidification locally and better enable uh, shell formation. Risks include changes to ocean bi biogeochemistry, introduction of trace materials that can be in the crushed up minerals and rocks that are added, um, and expanded mining activities on land that would be needed to access the, the suitable rocks to be used here. Um, and there are uncertainties in the specifics of the application, logistical challenges in accessing and transporting rock, um, and doing this at scale, would require significant mining and quarrying uh, to get to get significant amounts of rock if we were to do this at scale. 
And several, several companies are starting to pursue this approach. One that's gotten a fair amount of media attention is called Vesta, and they're adding ground up olivine rocks or sand um, to coastlines as a way to do both um, nourishment of eroded beaches as well as carbon removal. Um, and near, nearly at the end of the approaches, um, electrochemical techniques um, are, are the next set, and they, these involve using electricity to accelerate reactions that remove CO2 from seawater. There are two main types of approaches here, creating alkalinity um, as a variation of alkalinity enhancement and directly extracting CO2 from seawater. So risks include um, effluent discharges, mining uh, for material inputs, and um, safely managing chemical byproducts like chlorine gas and hydrogen that can be associated with some variations of the approach. Um, and this approach, I think, is a bit earlier stage. Um, there are several companies that are working on developing at-sea pilots. One that's been in the news recently um, is Captura, which I believe is based in California. And then I think I just saw today another um, announcement that I'm forgetting the name of the company, unfortunately. But um, so that's electrochemical approaches. And the last approach is artificial downwelling, which involves um, accelerating natural currents that carry carbon-rich surface water into the deep ocean by cooling surface water or pumping it to depth. Very little research has been done on this approach, and what little has been done shows very high costs. Um, and risks include cooler surface waters and warmer subsurface waters that can alter weather patterns, reduce net carbon flux, and impact ecosystems. So this approach um, is kind of the most theoretical at this point among all of them. And my assessment is that there's not much interest from anyone in pursuing it. Um, so that's, that's why I kind of put it at the end. But I guess just some general comments across all the approaches before I move on to the next piece. Um, the I think the impacts of the approaches and how well uh, they work and how they're interpreted depend on the scale of the intervention. So of course, like very large scale seaweed farming will have very different impacts than a small scale project. Um, and it also depends a lot on who is doing these projects and the credibility and intentions of the person or, or organization doing them. Um, so I'm just gonna shift gears a bit to talk about the governance side of things. Uh, first, the legal framework that applies to these approaches. And I'm showing this graphic because location matters in terms of governance, where an ocean CDR approach takes place within ocean maritime boundaries provides the foundation for any assessment of what legal framework applies to that approach. So within a country's exclusive economic zone, EEZ, the 200 nautical miles from the coast, countries can largely util utilize marine resources as they want to exploit, explore, conserve, and manage those resources. So it's entirely up to the national and local laws and regulations. Other countries can also undertake activities in a country's EEZ with that country's consent. In the high seas, the area outside the EEZ, we look to international treaties and agreements. Um, and we mainly in our report considered the international framework, um, which is important for two reasons. One, because large scale CDR will likely need to occur in the high seas um, to reach that large scale. So the part in dark blue in this graphic and two, the international framework is also highly influential on domestic legal frameworks. Most international treaties that pertain to ocean CDR have an obligation on parties for them to either apply the instruments domestically or to adopt other measures to apply them domestically. Um, so the legal frameworks that are relevant in the context of ocean CDR prim primarily include the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the London Convention, and the London Protocol. Um, because these frameworks predate the concept of ocean CDR, they're in place to regulate other types of marine activities, but they're now being applied to ocean CDR approaches, sometimes with differing interpretations. So for example, UNCLOS provides general rights to undertake marine scientific research in the high seas. 
The Convention on Biological Diversity contains general provisions relevant to CDR that include environmental impact assessments and identification of monitoring of activities likely to have significant adverse impact on biodiversity. Um, and the London Convention and, and London Protocol regulate addition of material to the ocean, such as, so that would impact approaches like iron fertilization and alkalinity enhancement that require addition of material to the ocean. Um, uh, the, the explicit provisions that relate to ocean CDR are in the form of non-binding bans on everything but small-scale research. So this complex patchwork of resolutions and decisions under this Convention on Biological Diversity and the London Convention and Protocol has led to some differing, differing perspectives among governments and organizations. And <clears throat> for the most part, for ocean CDR approaches that we've discussed, it becomes a matter of legal and legal interpretation on a case-by-case -case basis to consider the method, the size, et cetera. Um, and then within a country's national jurisdiction, not in the high seas, national laws and governance frameworks will apply and in most cases determine whether research activities or commercial deployment can proceed and under what conditions. And it was beyond the scope of our, of our assessment to provide a detailed analysis of what domestic laws might apply to ocean CDR approaches across all countries. Um, but there is work ongoing elsewhere that helps to start map mapping that helps to start mapping that out. Um, and most, if not all countries, will likely have a similar patchwork approach to ocean CDR unless domestic laws have been enacted to specifically respond to ocean CDR research or deployment. Um, and one of the main uh, one of the main concerns regarding the ability of the current international legal framework to govern ocean CDR is that the focus of these um, existing frameworks is on prohibition of harm rather than also on proactively managing how ocean CDR approaches are developed and deployed within a robust governance framework that considers the full life cycle of an ocean CDR project. And so for a more robust governance framework, um, we outlined some additional considerations that would need to be addressed, such as ensuring ocean CDR takes place in um, ocean CDR that takes place in na national waters does so within strong um, national and local sustainable ocean management frameworks. Ensuring appropriate codes of conduct and safeguards are put in place for at sea research demonstrations and commercial deployment. Ensuring broad and inclusive stakeholder engagement. Um, in the decision making process around any projects, resolving who decides when, if, under what conditions to move from research to deployment, reaching consensus on the balance between the potential for harm to the ocean environment and benefits of deployment, um, and resolving equity issues around intellectual property and commercialization. Um, and I also wanted to mention a few aspects of ocean CDR that make it even more complex than land-based CDR, which is already complex and um, somewhat controversial. But there's generally um, a smaller knowledge base around the proposed ocean CDR approaches. Most have only been proposed and modeled in lab laboratory settings. So there's uncertainty about their efficacy, whether they can actually sequester carbon, and their impacts on the environment and coastal communities. Um, the ocean is also obviously interconnected and moving, so impacts, any potential impacts of these approaches would not be contained to one area. Um, and this transboundary nature of the ocean can also make monitoring um, and verification difficult, particularly the further away from the shore you move, where the ocean itself is less and less explored and less well understood. Um, the lack of an international governance framework <clears throat> has also caused ambiguity and differing interpretations as to how to understand ocean CDR in the context of existing international governance frameworks. And then we also thought that the, cult the kind of cultural and emotional significance that the ocean holds makes public perception and social license particularly important. Um, and so one of the reasons we decided to write this paper 
Um, last year is that there's been a, a surge, a huge increase in interest in ocean-based carbon removal approaches as countries and companies have made commitments for net zero emissions. So some, some companies are already investing in ocean CDR approaches and around half the countries, a little less than half the countries that have submitted long-term low emission development strategies, to the U United Nations Convention on Climate Change, um, mention the planned use of carbon removal technologies and two countries, the United States and Japan specifically mention um, exploring the potential reliance on ocean-based carbon removal. Um, also, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine in the U.S. released a report, I guess late 2021, um, outlining a federal research agenda for the U.S on the topic of ocean CDR, which raised its profile, and they uh, recommended between $1.3 and $1.4 billion to be spent on R&D, &D, um, federal R&D &D funding over 10 years, including 125 million over that time period on foundational research, foundational research that cuts across all the approaches. Um, and, uh, another point on on why we why we decided to write this paper. There's also a lack of um, sufficient governance at the inter international level and in many countries, as I hope was made <laughs> clear in the last section. Um, and then also because ocean CDR can be um, controversial, I think there can be a tendency to avoid it or push it to later on. But our feeling was kind of that this this is moving ahead. Um, so there's a need to kind of put forward recommendations about how how it should be done. Um, and of course, there's scientific uncertainty with most of the CDR approaches. So additional theoretical lab scale, small scale at sea testing is needed before their merits and trade-offs can be adequately evaluated. Um, and so, I'll go through some of the recommendations that we include at the end of our report. We focus on the need, as is in the title, but yeah, throughout the report, we focus on the need for informed and responsible development of ocean CDR. So this means that in considering the opportunities presented by emerging ocean CDR pathways, um, the global climate community should work to not just develop ocean CDR approaches based on carbon removal efficiency and cost, but also to develop them responsibly, including not pursuing development where environmental or ecological or social risks are shown to outweigh the expected benefits. And so ultimately, ocean CDR deployment and unabated climate change involve a trade-off between different sets of risks. Um, and so in our report, we define informed and responsible development and deployment. Um, as development, as development and deployment that um, occurs iteratively to ensure response, to ensure research priorities adapt with new findings about viability, maximizes benefits and trade-offs to, um, sorry, maximizes benefits and minimizes uh, trade-offs and harm to potentially impacted people, economies, and marine ecosystems is aligned with the precautionary principle, is conducted with rigorous monitoring and transparent reporting when implementing small-scale field trials for the purpose of foundational research, operates within a robust national and global governance framework when deploying mid or large-scale ocean CDR that allocates liability for harm and provides safeguards and a measurement reporting and verification framework, includes stakeholders and development uh, and deployment process decisions and equitably distributes benefits and costs. So just to reiterate, we would not consider development of ocean CDR approaches that solely prioritizes cost effectiveness and carbon removal as responsible, although these considerations will be foundational in, to whether a given approach is viable for deployment. And so we lay out three sets of recommendations. The first is aimed at resolving uncertainties through increased funding for research. Uh, the second is aimed at improving the governance frameworks for pilot and research projects at sea. And the third 
aims for development of a new framework that comprehensively and proactively regulates ocean CDR. So two key points within this, strong governance frameworks can develop alongside efforts to expand understanding and scientific certainty of the application of carbon removal. And particularly on the first recommendation, as I think I said before, this should be an iterative process, meaning it adapts based on incremental R, D, and D outcomes, including ceasing investment if negative impacts are insurmountably high. And I think a key theme that comes through the report is that a lot of this comes down to balancing the urgency of emissions reductions um, and the risks of having ocean CDR on the table as an approach versus the risks of not having ocean CDR on the table. And then understanding and determining how this balancing changes as the climate crisis worsens. Um, and so, as Sarah mentioned up top, we put out this report in November of last year, um, which is on the WRI website and hopefully easily searchable. And then we also put out a summary article, um, kind of a blog post that summarizes some of the key takeaways from the report. Um, so I think that's all that I had. Um, I guess, of course, this is just, just a summary of the report uh, that we did and not a definitive comprehensive overview of all ocean CDR. So just one small caveat, but um, yeah, I guess, Okay. Uh, questions. All right. Thank you so much, Katie. Uh, this was a great overview of, of just ocean CDR methods and uh, then the, the out, what you guys found in your report. Uh, so we really appreciate that. And um, thank you to everyone who's been participating in the chat and great information sharing. Um, just in case anyone's interested, I'll post my email address, although I suspect you all have it. Uh, if you want to copy of the chat um, and, and I'll see if Katie is able to share the presentation too. If, if you wanted to, um, if that's possible, you can contact me. I'll just post it right now. Um, and you will all get a link to the Octo page where the recording will be posted. Okay, so let's see, getting started with the questions um, and, and just I'll be, I'm, I'm more able to monitor the Q&A if you, if you want to everyone is welcome to post uh, your questions. I'm a little bit, it's a little easier for me to monitor the Q&A right now. Um, oh, let me share my video again. Okay. Can I stop sharing my screen also? No, it's good to have that information up, okay. up there. So yeah, great. Um, Okay, and um, let's see. This is from Matthias Heilwick. Um, he said, in addition to the cited prominent ocean CDR approaches, I suggest you mention also new promising ones such as shellfish farming, which is gaining credibility on this topic thanks to the biochemical understanding of the biomineralization process and real life affiliations of its carbon fluxes. Uh, so Matthias, um, if you wanted to share more on this, I know you've sent me a report. You, you're welcome to send, uh, post a link to that in the chat if, for people to take a look at. Um, okay, so there's a question um, regarding coastal blue carbon. I was under the impression that coastal seagrasses are some of the best carbon sinks on the planet. Why are they considered low potential for CDR? So I think on a per unit or per area basis, they're extremely efficient in CO2 sequestration and CO2 removal. Um, it's only because it's just the area where they exist is small compared to the potential, the theoretical potential of other approaches, such as alkalinity enhancement that could theoretically be applied across very large swaths of the ocean area. Um, seagrasses would be confined to coastal areas. So they do have a very meaningful potential. I think it's just not at the gigaton scale or the billion metric ton scale. But I, if I remember correctly, I think the National Academies estimated it was several hundred million tons potential. Um, and that in Sorry, I shouldn't quote the numbers because I don't remember them directly, but um, they obviously play a significant role in sequestering carbon already and reducing emissions, but then 
the restoration potential, I think, was um, never mind. I'm not going to say numbers because I don't remember them directly. But basically, the main takeaway is that they're not they're not at the gigaton scale, which is um, what some of the other approaches present potential for. But they are super important to preserve and super important for all the co-benefits that they provide. Okay, great. Thank you, Katie. Um, there was a, just a quick question about electrochemical removal. Um, is the carbon dioxide removed as a gas or converted to a solid? Um, I think it, it can, it's, it's removed as a gas, but it can be compressed. So this is one of the pieces or one of the, I guess, caveats with electrochemical approaches is that you have, you capture CO2 and then you have to do something with it. And so unlike the other approaches where the CO2 is sequestered in biological material or in carbonates that are stored in the ocean, in this approach, you have to do something with that captured CO2. And so that could be stored in geological formations on land, like CO2 captured from land-based approaches like direct air capture, um, or you could use it in products that could turn it into a solid, like concrete aggregate or something. Um, but yeah, it depends what you want to do with it, basically. Okay. All right. Thank you, Katie. Um, um, there was a question. Will there be implications of the BBNJ treaty for ocean CDR deployment? I think so. I honestly have not. I should say that I, my co-author who led on the governance section, Eliza, was not able to join today, but she's really the expert on the governance side and has been tracking these frameworks better than I have. So I think there certainly will be implications, but I don't think I can speak to those very well right now. Okay, great. No, <laughs> answer what you can, and we appreciate you being here. <laughs> um, well, let's try this one. Um, I, I don't know maybe more in Eliza's realm or not. Um, what CDR option has the most profit potential uh, that would make it more attractive and sustainable from a business perspective? Um, well, I think there is in the future potential for all the approaches if they are found to be effective and viable to sell carbon credits based on the carbon that they remove. And so this can be on the voluntary market, companies that have made commitments. And this is kind of what's driving the interest, um, increased interest in ocean-based CDR and carbon removal overall. Um, companies and eventually countries that have made these net zero commitments now need to find a way to get to net zero. And so they can reduce emissions as much as possible, but then most of them will have some amount of emissions that are very hard to abate left over that they'll need to counterbalance with um, carbon removal credits. And so approaches, companies that do carbon removal can sell these credits and that is a revenue opportunity. I think um, seaweed cultivation comes to mind as an option because you get, you can harvest the seaweed that grows and you can turn something, um, you can use the seaweed to turn into a product that hopefully would have lower emissions than a conventional version. And so um, depending on what product that is, I think there would be different revenue opportunities there. But the flip side of that piece is that you wouldn't always end up with carbon removal, but you could end up with emissions reductions, which is also beneficial. OK, thank you, Katie. Um, a question that came in. Um, thanks, Katie. Well-rounded presentation. Lots in the chat about carbon capacities, whales, and risks, ocean iron. Good to be reminded that all marine CDR uh, approaches need responsible research and development regarding uncertainties with respect to the durable carbon sequestration efficiencies, but also intended and unintended ecological impacts. My question is, does the WRI report agree with a NASM uh, report? And if not, what areas and to what extent? Um, I wouldn't say that there's a possibility of agreement or disagreement. I think it's more than National Academy's report laid out kind of the same way we do, but in <laughs> with more detail how these approaches work. And then they put forward recommendations on federal research spending in the US. 
I think we generally would agree with the fact that we need a lot more um, public governmental research to improve um, or increase research and development capacity and help address these uncertainties. And I think there's a def definitive role for the govern government to play here because carbon removal is largely a public good. And it's, um, I think, also a public good that developed countries have a bit more of a responsibility to provide given our role, disproportionate role in causing the climate crisis. Um, so anyway, sorry, <laughs> straying a bit from the question, but yeah, I think we generally agree with um, the National Academy's report, which suggests significantly scaled up government research funding for ocean CDR. They also, I think a few pieces that we reiterated in our report is that um, the iterative nature um, of this research and how they had a great graphic in the NASM report that kind of shows like stage gated research where if you go so far, you get positive results, you keep going. If you hit kind of a, a roadblock or something, not a, road, a roadblock, but um, something that would indicate insurmountable negative impacts, then you should stop that research. And so um, that iterative adaptive approach, I think is something that we tried to emphasize as well. And then they also have a strong emphasis on the need for more social science around ocean CDR development, research and development. So that 125 million over 10 years I mentioned for foundational research includes a lot of that um, uh, basic science on the, um, the hard sciences side as well as the social sciences side to uh, make sure that these approaches are being developed um, equitably and without significant social impacts. Okay, thank you, Katie. And on that topic, um, uh, is Congress, when they're talking about um, carbon dioxide removal, are they talking about ocean carbon dioxide removal specifically or just general carbon dioxide removal, not even really talk, or just terrestrial? Um, and do you have any sense of the federal money going into ocean CDR and whether ocean CDR is included in any upcoming bills? Yeah, so I, I debated adding a few slides on the US policy context, but um, overall, carbon removal has gotten a lot more federal funding. So not ocean CDR specifically, but land-based um, carbon removal technologies like direct air capture. They've gotten a lot more funding in the past four or five years, particularly a huge bump in the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, which allocated $3.5 to direct air capture hubs and several billion more for CO2 transport and sequestration infrastructure. So land-based CDR has gotten a lot um, from the federal government recently, in addition to increasing um, annual appropriations for DOE research. On the ocean side, there's not been very much at all around ocean CDR specifically. There's the recent FY23 omnibus appropriations bill that came out um, had 10 million at the Department of Defense for the Sea Fuel Act, that's ocean CDR. Um, capture or direct uh, direct carbon removal from the ocean uh, for fuel, synthetic fuel production. And that's been around for a few years. There was also a new directive, not specific funding allocation, but directive for work on ocean CDR at NOAA within the existing um, funding at the National Oceanic Partnership Program. So they're just directed to start coordinating um, work on ocean CDR there. There was also 2 million for the Department of the Interior's Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management for geologic carbon sequestration on the outer continental shelf. This was all in the FY23 omnibus. And then separately there's um, ARPA-E, the Advanced Research Project, I forget what that last A stands for, Advanced Research Projects Energy. Um, they've been funding work around seaweed cultivation uh, for the Mariner project for several years. And so looking at how to um, cultivate seaweed at a more effectively at, and bring down the costs there. So there's kind of been a smattering of um, small amounts of funding, I think, toward different pieces of ocean CDR, but 
um, I think there probably needs to be a lot more funding for Ocean CDR and more coordinated and centralized, perhaps at uh, NOAA or NOAA in coordination with DOE, EPA, et cetera, other agencies. So, yeah. So I think when when Congress says ocean, when Congress says CDR, most of the funding that they're referring to is going toward land-based approaches. But there are there is, I think, growing interest in ocean CDR, um, particularly from some of the agencies like NOAA. And I think actually in the recent FY23 appropriations, um, DOE, which got 140 million, I think 15 million of that is directed to go toward ocean CDR. So that's slow incremental progress, but a lot more will be needed. Okay, that's really helpful. Uh, thank you, Katie. Um, a question, it seems that many companies are already deploying pilot projects or will in the next year, small scale at first. How fast can we improve governance for pilots? Yeah, I think, um, so I think that's true. I think some companies are starting to do this. And I think it depends on a lot of things, the scale, where it happens, what approach it is, whether it's um, strictly for research, et cetera. And I think the governance will need to improve. One, so I, I don't have an answer on how fast that's possible. I think one first step that was also um, recommended in the National Academies report and that we also recommend in our report is to develop a code of conduct around ocean um, CDR research pilots that happen at sea. So codes of conduct exist in other scientific realms and developing one here that would include stipulations around um, ethical and responsible intervention, I think would be a good first step in that direction. Um, but yeah, I think it will depend and, and I guess I'm talking about that within the US context and then hopefully other countries that are um, that have projects going in this direction or research funding going in this direction would be able to do a similar code of conduct. Um, yeah, so I think that that's a that's a first step. But then, yeah, depending on the country, I think more would need to be done um, in terms of building up governance frameworks in addition to that. Okay, all right, thank you, Katie. Um, there's a question, how does the WRI report address carbon dioxide uptake by the ocean in the near term, um, and then it's released back to the atmosphere in the longer term, say 2050, as carbon dioxide or methane from ocean hypoxia and anaerobic sediments? Yeah, so that, um, we honestly didn't get too much into that. I think our focus is more on the near term but I think that's a very valid point in the longer term um, that probably needs more research to understand the exact, like the, to better understand the impact of um, that uh, CO2 movement back into the atmosphere. So yeah, sorry, not, not a very good answer, but we didn't really get into that um, piece in our report given our kind of near-term focus. Okay. Um, no, yeah, thank you, David. That was a good point. Uh, okay, another question. Almost all of the elements of the responsible governance framework for ocean CDR that you propose would already be captured if the measures developed under the London Protocol were widely adopted and properly implemented. So would it be better to focus on that in the first instance rather than trying to generate something in parallel? Yeah, and this is also a question that I think that I wish Eliza were here to answer. She would do a lot better job than I would. But I think our our recommendations are kind of intentionally pushing the bar as high as we would want, ideally. But perhaps there is a more kind of in the real world, it's, it will obviously take a long time to develop a new treaty. And then what happens if people don't sign on or countries, parties don't sign on to it? Um, so there is certainly, I think there's been a lot of discussion in the literature about 
the merits of using existing, using, adapting, leveraging existing um, legal frameworks versus developing a new one. Um, so yeah, I don't think I can comment very, very well on uh, that given that Eliza was really the one that led on the governance side of things, but um, I think that's a very valid point. And I, I'll just say our, we were trying to put forward recommendations about what we would ideally want to happen, but recognize that the ideal and the reality may not be exactly the same. Okay, thank you, Katie. Um, let's see, a que question. Kelp ecosystem restoration is a massive opportunity for CDR. Um, is there a reason why it's not mentioned? The focus on seaweed farming is a narrow view of the kelp potential. So I would consider kelp to be within the seaweed cultivation, macroalgae cultivation, with kelp being one type of macroalgae. So I think kelp has probably gotten a lot of attention within the different types of macroalgae or seaweed that could be cultivated. Um, and I, yeah, I would definitely consider that within the, the macroalgae cultivation section yeah, I think, that we did. I think their aim is more focused on the um, ecosystem restoration rather than sort of commercial or uh, oh, yeah. cultivation. But. Yeah, I guess, I think, Yes, I think ecosystem, I think a lot of these approaches will begin in coastal areas and ecosystem restoration will definitely be helpful, important, play a role. I think it's just when when we think about getting to a gigaton scale, we're going to have to go beyond coastal applications and ecosystem restoration and go toward kind of larger applications in the high seas. So I think it'll be an evolution that will hopefully include that piece near the beginning. Okay, um, let's see. And, and some of the, the later things are, are sort of questions and also comments. Um, let's see, there's one, seaweed is extremely nutritious. Why only discuss with respect to feeding ruminants when they are uh, the major source of methane, um, much stronger car climate forcer than carbon dioxide? Why not talk about feeding humans themselves, co-benefits of shellfish seaweed systems um, as an important part of shifting to more sustainable diets? Yeah, I think there's also definitely a role for seaweed to play as a food, um, a protein option for humans as well. I think the ruminant meat, um, or rum sorry, ruminant animal feed um, has gotten a lot of attention just because there aren't so many other ways to reduce those methane emissions. And so um, the seaweed that has been identified to be able to do that can reduce them up to 50%, I think, in the most recent studies. And so I think that's just a, yeah, methane has a higher GHG impact. There aren't really that many other options to deal with this. So that's why it's exciting. Um, but yeah, I think the role for seaweed in sustainable um, human protein, protein for humans to eat, as well as um, I think fish fish meal is another role where uh, seaweed could play, um, or another area where seaweed could play a role substituting for um, conventional fish meal. Okay, thank you, Katie. All right, one last question, we'll wrap up, very big picture. Uh, what would you suggest is the number one priority in terms of carbon removal to achieve our Paris Agreement goals? I think the number one need would be to scale it up um, faster, but in a way that is still responsible and equitable. And so I think in the ocean side of things, I already said it, so it's not a very interesting answer, but I think increased federal funding for research to resolve some of the scientific uncertainties that remain will be the first step along with the development of a code of conduct for at sea research pilots. Great, okay, thank you. And that, that was actually a question that came in. That wasn't me making it up. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, thank you so much. This was great and a great discussion and, and the great, uh, thank you so much for everyone for all your input and the chat and your questions. And Katie, we really appreciate you being here um, and, and actually doing it on such short notice because I only contacted you several weeks ago. 
No problem. Um, and thank you, um, everyone. And we hope to see you on future webinars. So, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having Katie, me. Katie, you're welcome back anytime. And we'd love to hear about your, your future research. Okay. All right. <laughs> Bye, thank everyone. You.